Good. It's called Walking with Intent. Uh, Danny is part of the project that uh, we're working on, Human Henge, and we've got various uh, posters and displays for you to have a look at here whilst we're milling about later on. Uh, over to you, Danny. Grand, so, okay. to show me how to use the. So if I want to move uh, the slide. on, just press that. Uh, press down. Yeah. And is that slide one? That's slide one. That's right. What, what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the nice thing is. <laughs> Um, I don't work in um, uh, academia at all, I work um, in a mental health context uh, with the Richmond Fellowship um, and I just turned up this morning expecting to see Tim and Laura etc and apparently Laura's got a cold and, uh, so I haven't read this um, and it's not what I normally do so bear with, um, <laughs> I could, it's, it's my excuse for just uh, uh, flopping it as I go along. So, um, so really I'm hoping that this is just a description of the projects that we've been involved in so that it'll be uh, familiar with me in that respect. Um, <coughs> so, uh, there are these moments in time and space, these conjunctions, when ideas coalesce, and I wonder if TAG 2017 is one of them, uh, where we can talk about health, uh, psychogeographies, forgetting, time, memory, poetry and place, and have a sense of resonance and reciprocity across our overlapping interests. Uh, but I'm at the end, before the beginning since resonance and reciprocity are words from the vocabulary of group analysis, to which I'll come to um, later. Um, I was at the, um, so, so bear in mind, this is Laura. <laughs> uh, <so. laughs> I was at the session <laughs> on archaeology and mental health um, at TAG 2015, when we were developing Human Henge. I watched a YouTube video of Dr. Rathhouse's, or Rathhouse's um, talk last night. It reminded me how helpful the papers and conversations were to our thinking. Um, this is a shared endeavour. So as a non-archaeologist, thank you, TAG. Um, uh, now, I'll tell you something about the Restoration Trust. We're a small charity that supports people to engage with heritage, art and culture so their mental health improves. Um, we call this <coughs> culture therapy. Uh, we are usually producers. We um, broker partnerships, develop projects, find the money and manage the project. Um, our current heritage focus um, uh, foci are archaeology in the historic landscape and archives. Why? Well, it's partly pragmatic. Availability and a culture of public entitlement to information um, in both arenas. Uh, but it's also because both archives and archaeology have a delicious tension between the quest for knowledge and the impossibility of total success in that quest. Um, it is there in the space between knowing and not knowing that our projects make a difference. Um, for that's where our, ima our imagination lives. And more of that later too. Um, heritage and mental health are certainly political, uh, politically congruent at the moment. Mental health um, demand is rising. Services are shrinking. National and local government need new ways to help people with their mental health. So all the various organs of the state, including lottery distributors, are on the case. Arts are front runners, for example, with the report Creative Health, published by the All Party Parliamentary Group on Arts and Health. Museums are catching up through the work of uh, Professor Helen Chatterjee and her colleagues, but the wider heritage lags behind. It lacks a champion. Yet here it is, all around us, visible, hidden, and intangible, and the thought of therapeutic landscapes lies deep within us. Our two current landscape projects, a human henge at Stonehenge, and now at Avery, and Borough Castle Almanac at Borough Castle Roman Fort in Norfolk. Both projects are largely Heritage Lottery Fund funded. Borough Castle Almanac kicks off properly in January. It's a year-long 24-session programme that happens two years running. Walking, talking, and making at the castle and at Time and Tide Museum in Great Yarmouth. Norfolk Archaeological Trust is the lead partner. Human Henge, you'll hear about from Professor Darvel and Dr Heaslett, and I hope also from members who are here at TAG. Uh, briefly, it's a programme of 10 weekly walks for a facilitated group, accompanied by archaeologists and musicians. Pilot 1 ran from October to December 2016, Pilot 2 from January to March 2017. In January, we'll run Pilot 3 at Avebury, so um, uh, from January 2018, to see how a different site impacts on the process. 
Uh, there is masses of information about human hens online at um, humanhens.org, uh, www.humanhens.org. Um, I'd like to pay tribute to the whole astonishing network of participants, support workers, volunteers, board members, funders, partners, experts, creatives, researchers and staff who are at the project. Um, they, along with the sites, the collections, the weather, the administration, the biscuits, uh, make up the human hens matrix to use group terminology once more. Slide two. And it works. Uh, <laughs> both human hens and bird castle almanac meet our criteria for success listed um, mm. on the slide. Um, so that's participants have problems with their mental health. Participants in, are included in the management of the project. Uh, partnership with cultural and health organisations. Um, group work is the core. Um, a safe framework and practice. Proper measurement of impact and outcomes. Um, sustained and regular involvement. Privileged access to real cultural assets and expertise. And we can unpack a, a, a lot of what that means um, later on. Um, encouragement to be creative. Learning for staff and volunteers. Um, and progression for participants. Um, and there is an awful lot of learning for staff and volunteers. And, and, and it's been quite an interesting project. So let's take one of these. Group work is the core. Uh, uh, folks uh, describe what um, happens when a collection of individual, uh, individuals meets routinely together with someone he named a conductor. They will begin to live, feel, think, act, and talk more in terms of we than in terms of I, you and he. At the same time, and I want to stress this point, the individuals do not become submerged, but on the contrary, show up their personal characteristics more and more distinctly within the dynamic interplay of an ever-changing and often highly dramatic scene. Um, as soon as this little sample community shows signs of organisation and structure, um, and structure in the way described, we'll call it a group. Um, this is what we're trying to achieve in human hands. So over 10 weeks of sustained and regular involvement within a context of safe frameworks and practice, and with expert facilitation, in this case from Yvette Stalens uh, with Danny O'Donoghue, um, a group begins to form. How does a historic landscape help? Or rather, how does being in a historic <coughs> landscape, in the company of people who, not, who know a lot about it, help? Because that's one of our criteria, privileged access to real cultural assets and expertise. Um, it's only human to be in nature, uh, to use our bodies um, and minds to, to connect with each other, to be creative. And it's certainly better than some of the alternatives, such as loneliness, boredom, sadness. But why the historic bit? Um, it is not a universal prescription. For strange as it may seem, not everyone is interested in the past. Uh, but for those who are, and who can find the strength to face the daunting prospect of a project like Human Hens, and it is a challenge. Um, if you take a group of people, um, very disparate, so they're not already a group, um, uh, anxiety, depression, schizoaffective disorders, manic depression, etc., and just bundle us all together and see what happens, it is quite an enterprise. Um, and that's been one of the things that's been really interesting from our point of view as Richmond Fellowship. Um, so the daunting prospect of a project like Human Hens Historic landscapes are one way to face down mental illnesses, erosion of the self. Mental illness attacks space. For example, it, it fills mental space with futile rumination, terrifying psychosis, but it negates it with a horrible combination of restlessness and passivity and depression. It makes space malignant, so it cannot be traversed to connect with others. It compromises time as it telescopes the past into the present with all-consuming flashbacks. Without space to think, to act, nothing creative can happen. Um, there can be no imagination, no relating. The group experience of a historic landscape, illuminated by people who know about it, opens up multiple vistas of temporal, topographical, psychological space. It's a shortcut to the imagination. Um, when people feel safe enough to take the enormous risk 
of embarking on a journey in both time and space, taking part in a strange well-being experiment <coughs> in some fields, albeit fields that are among the most famous on the planet, with people they've never met, um, that's uh, when they may do things they never thought possible. Um, and it is when, hopefully, they can enjoy the richness of their own humanity. Um, I'll leave you with this uh, poem by Chris Jessup. Um, so, early in our first encounter, Claire declared herself a nutter. Ten weeks have passed without a sign of anything like so malign. We all went on the cursus walking, taming Geiligers, um, with much talking. In the eve, the stars shone bright, giving us a gentle light. Later on, a mist arose, making all mysterious. Are your emotions healthy? Have you had your MOT? I expect that you are wondering what on earth these letters be. Why, it's the mental opportunities tuning from the human hinge degree. And that's what Laura would have said. <laughs> <laughs> Not slightly more, Brian! <laughs>